The first lesson of quantum theory is the concept of wave-particle duality. Every physical entity can be thought of as either a wave or a particle, depending on the particular situation. A second lesson of quantum theory is the uncertainty principle put forward by Werner Heisenberg in 1927. It also presents a profound challenge to the assumptions of classical physics. Trajectory is defined as the path through which an object moves. Heisenberg began by destroying this concept. It had always been taken for granted that the description of the motion for a given object could be described precisely. In fact, classical mechanics is built on the assumption that it can do just that. Describe and predict the position and velocity of an object along its path of motion at any given time. Experimental measurements of position and velocity would always be imprecise, of course. But that imprecision was based on limitations of the instruments and could, in principle, be decreased to any desired amount. Heisenberg challenged this assumption. Consider the case of a marble rolling off a chute and then falling through space. Can we, in an ideal experiment, determine its trajectory exactly? Since this is an ideal experiment, we can assume that a perfect vacuum can be created for the experimental chamber, so there is no air resistance whatsoever, not even from a single molecule. We are also free to assume that our instruments can measure to any desired accuracy. Is there anything else that might still interfere with an exact determination of the trajectory? Heisenberg said yes. To determine the position of the marble, we have to shine a light on it in order to see it. Now, solidly established theory, backed by experiment, shows that waves will bend around an object. And it shows that the fuzziness inherent in using a wave to determine the position of an object can only be reduced by using smaller and smaller wavelengths in relation to the object. A reasonable estimate is that delta x, the inherent uncertainty in the position of the object, is equal to or greater than the wavelength used. So the shorter the wavelength, the less uncertainty there is in the position of the marble. This is not in itself a problem, since we can, in this ideal experiment, use as short a wavelength as we like, running up the spectrum into ultraviolet radiation, X-rays, or gamma rays. But consider this. The Compton effect tells us that the light, in bouncing off the marble, gives it a little kick, changing its trajectory even as it measures it. In classical physics, where light is strictly a wave, we can reduce the intensity of the light by any desired amount, thereby reducing the deflection of the marble to any desired amount. But in quantum physics, a beam of light is not a wave. It is a collection of photons. Reducing the intensity of the beam means reducing the number of photons, with each one retaining the same amount of energy. Now, in order to see the marble, at least one photon must bounce off of it. We know from the Compton effect that each photon has a momentum p equal to Planck's constant, h, divided by its wavelength, lambda. We cannot predict the exact amount by which the momentum of the marble will change. 
But we do know that the change in momentum, delta P, will be about equal to the momentum of the photon. That is, delta P is approximately equal to H over lambda. This means that the only way to reduce the uncertainty in the momentum is to use longer and longer wavelengths. Now we have a problem. For reducing the uncertainty in the momentum will increase the uncertainty of the position. Combining the two formulas, we get delta P delta X is greater than or equal to H. A more detailed and sophisticated analysis shows that delta P delta X is actually greater than or equal to H over 4 pi. But since the concept remains the same, we will stay with the simpler formula. Since the momentum, P, can also be written as mass times velocity, we can also rewrite this as delta X delta MV equals H, or as delta X delta V equals H over M. This is the Heisenberg uncertainty principle and it is often stated as it is impossible in the very nature of things to know both the precise position and precise velocity of an object at the same time. Another equally valid restatement of the principle is the more that is known about the position of an object the less that can be known in principle about its velocity. The more that is known about its velocity the less that can be known, in principle, about its position. The formula itself shows why it can easily be ignored in day-to-day -day experience. The total uncertainty, delta x delta v, shared between the uncertainty in position and uncertainty in velocity, equals h over m. So the only variable is m, the mass of the object and the more massive the object, the less the uncertainty, delta x, delta v. Moreover, Planck's constant, h, is extremely small. So in the case of a man, mouse, marble, or even a BB, the uncertainty principle is not at all important. In fact, the uncertainty in position or velocity of any object large enough to be visible is so small that it is difficult to see how it could even be measured. With objects approaching the size and mass of a molecule or atom, however, the uncertainty principle becomes important. And with subatomic particles, it becomes even more important, for as mass decreases, and the uncertainty increases, the uncertainty in relation to the mass and size of the object increases even faster. Now obviously, if the position and velocity of an object are in principle unknowable, then the concept of the trajectory as the exact path through which an object moves becomes meaningless. How then to describe the motion of subatomic particles? This is where de Broglie waves come in. Consider, in a wave, some physical quantity is varying with time. The measurement of that quantity is graphed as its amplitude. In water waves, it is the height of the water that is varying. In sound waves, it is the amount of pressure in the substance that the wave is traveling through. In de Broglie waves, the question is, what is it that is varying? It has been given a symbol, psi, and a name, the wave function. But what is the wave function of a de Broglie wave? Does it represent any physical reality? The answer is no. The de Broglie waves of quantum theory are no more real than trajectories in classical theory. They are related to the motion of particles in quantum mechanics 
in much the same way that trajectories are related to the motion of particles in classical mechanics. So, just as we think of the trajectory of an object as an abstract idea that describes its movement through space, we must think of the de Broglie wave associated with an object as an abstract idea that describes its movement through space. Thus, the wave function, psi, becomes a measure of the probability that the particle will be found at that particular point in space. That is, the quantity which is varying in a de Broglie wave is the probability of the particle being at a particular point in space at a given time. And the amplitude of the de Broglie wave is, therefore, a probability amplitude. Consider what this means. From the time of Newton on, scientists thought of the universe as a gigantic clockwork mechanism. The position and velocities of all the objects in it were precisely determined by the positions and velocities of the moment before. But now, with the advent of quantum theory, precise positions and velocities of objects are, in principle, unknowable. And future positions are no longer predicted as precise trajectories, but as probabilities. The future is, in principle, unknown and unknowable. With quantum theory, then, the universe ceases to look like a complicated clockwork mechanism and begins to resemble a complicated game of roulette or dice instead. Some physicists look at this as revealing an important aspect of reality. Others see this as a flaw in quantum theory. Einstein was one of these. Einstein's work on the photoelectric effect, remember, was central to the early development of the theory. It was so important, in fact, that when Einstein received the Nobel Prize in 1921, it was his work on the photoelectric effect that was mentioned, not his theory of relativity. And it was Einstein, remember, whose paper supported the concept that the electron had a wavelength associated with it, thereby calling Schrodinger's attention to de Broglie's work. Yet, ironically, Einstein never did accept the fully developed quantum theory as more than a useful tool, a temporary expedient. In a letter written in 1926, he said, The quantum mechanics is very imposing, but an inner voice tells me that it is still not the final truth. The theory yields much, but it hardly brings us nearer to the secret of the old one. Einstein may yet turn out to be right. Quantum theory is one level in the hierarchy of ideas about the universe. There may be yet another level of understanding even more subtle than quantum theory, and the underlying level may turn out once again to be deterministic, just as Einstein hoped. But it is important to realize that at its own level, quantum theory does describe the behavior of the universe. The theory is used because the predictions, probabilistic though they are, work. God, Einstein said, in objecting to quantum theory, does not play dice. Yet, as one physicist recently pointed out, in the last quarter of the 20th century, he still appears to be doing just that.